Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining me today. My name is Brandon Satram, and I'm the Vice President of Experience Engineering at Blues Wireless, an IoT product company. Now, to get things started today, I wanna to talk about purgatory, specifically the prototype or proof of concept purgatory that we often find ourselves in as builders. And we all know that hardware is hard, but that in and of itself doesn't explain the reason why 75% of IoT projects take twice as long as estimated, and that many end up being canceled at the pre-launch stage before the company even sees any value from the effort. And often it seems like the reason that this happens is because of the time that it takes to get a POC off the ground from an idea to something working and running on a small number of devices, often one, but sometimes just only two or three. Consider an example. So let's say you're looking to build a device to monitor outdoor, outdoor conditions on a farm, and for your POC, you start with your garden. So you buy the hardware you need and you grab your favorite MCU or single board computer. But this project is gonna be outside. So you're also gonna need a cellular modem. You grab one from QuickTel or Ublox or you grab a Nordic 9160 dev kit to help round some of that out for you. And that's great. So you have the pieces, but now you have to assemble them. And in order to do that, you have to figure out how to program the modem using whatever flavor of AT commands your modem vendor actually uses. And you need to source a SIM and data plan from somebody. Then you need to figure out where to send your data how to communicate remotely with your project if needed, where to store certs, how to encrypt your data and or uh, the data for transport. Oh, and if you wanna be able to perform firmware updates for the project you're managing, uh, when you're managing more than just a handful, you're gonna to have to think about how to do a DFU back to the device and hopefully not brick it at the same time. Now, alternatively, you could sign up for an IoT platform where all of these decisions are, are made for you, but you give up flexibility and control. You take the MCU, language, data limits, and pricing model that you get, and you don't have a fit. You follow the guardrails that are set out for you. And in either case, what we engineers have to deal with in this space more than almost any other is complexity. And you know, at any time that I think about complexity, I think about a quote uh, from our CEO of Blues Wireless, Ray Ozzie. That quote is, complexity kills. It sucks the life out of developers. It makes products hard to build, plan, and test. Now that's something that he said years ago, long before founding Blues, but boy, does this apply to the IoT space. We are awash in complexity in the internet of things. And over the years, we've tried to come up with various ways to manage complexity across our space. Some vendors manage complexity by setting up guardrails that you must navigate to make things easier, sure. And others try to standardize the processes, board layouts, or pins to make the ecosystem more modular. And there's some good examples of this. In the early days of Arduino's rise, there were a small number of pin layouts, which made it easy for other vendors to create shields that plug easily into a compatible Arduino to add additional capabilities. The Raspberry Pi is an even better example. With a 40 pin double wide header, the Pi in the add-on ecosystem that it created was so popular that the same header can be found on almost every competing single board Linux class computer out there just for the sake of compatibility with peripherals. And then there are some examples where we made a solid attempt, but the results were honestly kind of mixed. So take peripheral connectors, for instance. And in 2013, Seed Studio introduced the Humble Grove connector, a four pin JST that could be used to connect serial I squared C or even digital and analog uh, pins, GPIOs to the devices, and they fostered an ecosystem with a huge number of Grove compatible peripherals. But let's face it, as our boards and our projects got smaller, the humble Grove JST looks pretty beefy. So other vendors like SparkFun and Adafruit introduced their own variants using a smaller JST. SparkFun calls theirs Quick, and Adafruit calls theirs Stem QT. Two different names, same connector, and are they compatible? Kind of. <laughs> for most applications, you can use breakouts from SparkFun and Adafruit interchangeably with boards from either vendor, but there are a few edge cases, mostly around whether or not the peripheral has a logic level shifter and regulator so that it can be used with either three volt or five volt logic, which can potentially burn out the sensor if you get it wrong. And another example of where we've gotten mixed results to date in the world of, is in the world of firmware updates. Firmware updates perform remotely or over the air. And we spent a lot of time trying to solve this problem in SDKs and platforms, but has anybody really solved this problem in a way that doesn't force developers to give up control or embrace having to deal with complexity themselves? And that's what I wanna talk about today. The current state of OTA DFU and the two most predominant approaches that we have to choose from. Today, and then I wanna introduce a new third way that I think marries the best of both worlds into something new that we at Blues are calling outboard DFU. And I'll do a couple of demos along the way. 
Let's start by talking about OTA DFU as it stands today, and I'll provide a little primer on what both of these uh, TLAs mean. So starting with the DFU part, which stands for Device Firmware Update. And this is the process of getting new firmware on a device by laying down a binary with an updated program on some mem known memory address. In nearly, in nearly all cases, DFU relies on the existence of a bootloader on the device to be programmed. The bootloader is a small piece of code that is stored in non-volatile memory that's responsible for launching the main application loaded onto the device or providing a capability for updating the device firmware. Now, for the latter capability, many devices require that the device be placed in bootloader mode in order to apply the firmware update. For example, if you've ever flashed firmware to an SDM32 device using the Arduino USB, Arduino IDE and a USB connection between the computer and the USB port on a board, you've done a serial DFU and you've placed the device in a bootloader mode manually by holding the boot and reset buttons. Alternatively, if you've used a programmer like the ST-Link or J-Link to apply firmware to a device, you've not had to do this because the programmer can automatically place the device into bootloader mode using the SWD connector on the board. It's basically a hardwired connection to place the device into bootloader mode. And that fact will come back around in a little bit. So that's DFU. The OTA piece of the puzzle stands for over the air, which means the process of delivering new firmware to a target device happens over a wireless connection. And often you'll hear OTA DFU associated with using Bluetooth to update devices from Nordic or Scilabs using their mobile apps, but it doesn't have to be a blue, it doesn't have to be Bluetooth to be OTA DFU. Shipping a binary over cellular or Wi-Fi is also over the air. And in a world where nearly all IoT solutions, uh, all solutions are cloud connected, OTA DFU is a table stakes feature in these types of solutions. And we insist on having it because if we're going to take the time to add remote monitoring and control to an application, we probably also want to use the remote control capability to fix uh, the product without having to touch it, especially if those devices are no longer in our control. And in a world where we have to deal with botnets made up devices with firmware that can't be patched, it's beyond frowned upon to deploy a solution without thinking through how you can fix bugs or apply updates, not if, but when needed. But even today in 2022, OTA DFU is still complex and there are really only two approaches to it that are available to developers and each has sizable pros and cons. We call the first, let's just call the first OS DFU. And this is where one in which the vendor solves the DFU problem end to end within their kernel and their cloud service. The vendor solves all of the complexity of DFU for you, provides a cloud console for updating, uploading firmware, and facilitates managing firmware delivery to devices across the fleet. On the device side, the vendor provides firmware update capabilities as a part of their kernel or RTOS and manages every piece of receiving new firmware from the, from the cloud service, placing the device into its bootloader, and then updating the application or RTOS on the device, restarting it once it's updated. The advantage of the OSDFU approach is that it is completely hands-off for the developer once they load new firmware in the cloud console. The platform takes care of everything else from delivery to on-device updates. But the disadvantage of this approach is a lack of control on the part of the developer. In order for the vendor to make this experience hands-off, you have to place high guardrails in place and dictate a narrow set of supported hardware, programming language, and even IDE. To get the benefit of OSDFU, you do have to yield some of your freedom as a developer to the vendor. And the easiest way to tell whether or not a vendor uses an OSDFU approach is just to look at their hardware support for host MCUs. Do you have to use the hardware that they sell and manage in order to use this feature as opposed to an off the shelf kit or a chip based on your skill set or preference? That's probably OSDFU. On the other side is cooperative DFU. And, and in this approach, both the vendor and the developer have to complete some of the puzzle to make OS, OTA DFU work. They cooperate to make the DFU happen. Usually the way that this works is that the host vendor, is that the, the vendor hosts firmware binaries and provides secure delivery of those binaries to a host. Uh, but then the developer is responsible for writing the code needed to verify the binary, apply it to the host, and then restart the device. And, th and this approach is different depending on what form of wireless protocol you're using for OTA DFU, at least at the edge down onto the device itself. For example, if Bluetooth is the update mechanism, then the server, in this case, is often a Bluetooth capable device like a phone, and the device must be brought within a few meters of the host in order to initiate the update. 
And on the target, the process varies from one MCU vendor to the next in the wireless communication protocol, but it does sort of typically consist of getting notification that new firmware is available, receiving firmware from the server to host to the host one chunk at a time, and then placing that firmware in a temporary location in Flash, validating each chunk and or the entire binary when it's done, copying the complete firmware into the appropriate location for the application in Flash, and then resetting the device to run the firmware. Uh, and if you're not using Bluetooth for OTA DFU, then you're likely using cellular and Wi-Fi. And in this case, the server is an actual server. It's in this a remote cloud service that hosts and delivers the binaries for you. But beyond that, the process is pretty similar to what I described above. Your host still has to get the binary, validate the chunks or the entire thing, place the device in its bootloader, et cetera, et cetera, restart it, and you're good to go. Uh, and in the case of my company, we, we offer today as something like a cooperative DFU style approach. And I'm going to walk through that briefly because I'm going to demo exactly what it looks like. <clears throat> and for us, OTA DFU consists of two components, the note card and our note hub IO cloud service. And the note card is the hardware side of the equation that works with your host. It's a device to cloud data pump that comes in a small 30 by 35 millimeter package and it has an M.2 connector so that it can be incorporated into any design or field replaced as needed. The note card comes in Wi-Fi and cellular variants that are project swappable and the cellular variant includes 500 megs of data and 10 years of secure cellular connectivity in over 139 countries and counting and that data and the, the plan is included in the cost of the device. As a data pump, the note card is meant to be used with the MCU host of your choice. So you can pick an STM32, ESP32, Nordic device, or even an 8-bit Arduino and communicate with the note card using a 100% JSON API over serial or I2C. You can also use any embedded language that can print strings. And we have SDKs for C, C++, Arduino, TinyGo, Rust, and CircuitPython. And the cloud side of that equation when it comes to OTAD, if you was facilitated with NodeHub. And NodeHub serves really key, three key functions for developers. One is that it's meant to be a secure endpoint for note card devices to transfer data from your host or to receive messages from the cloud down to your ultimate uh, hardware solution. It's also meant to be a thin piece of middleware so that you can route event data from your sensors to whatever cloud service that you use. And then finally, as a device and fleet management command center for monitoring devices, updating configuration, and shipping firmware via OTA DFU. And NoteUp can deliver firmware updates for the note card itself and its core functions running on an STM, uh, that are run on an STM32L4 chip on the board. And it can also securely download, verify, and deliver firmware updated, updates that are meant for your host. And as recently as a couple of weeks ago, the Blues process for host firmware updates was in line with the cooperative DFU approach that I've already described. NodeHub hosts the firmware and delivers it securely to the note card. And once downloaded and verified, the note card informs the host that a firmware update is ready. But then the host, like before, is responsible for retrieving the binary one chunk at a time, verifying it, and applying the new fir firmware using the host-defined approach of putting the device in its bootloader, and so on and so on. So let's take a look at the demo of this process with a note card and with an ESP32. Now I'll switch over uh, the cameras and desktop for that. On the desk here, I have the an ESP32 that's connected to the Blues Wireless note card via this uh, Note Carrier F, which is this daughter board that we have that facilitates a connection between the two. So the ESP32 is communicating with the note card, and I'm going to show off the cooperative DFU approach. Uh, this is running a binary and I'm going to update it and sort of show you what that flow looks like if you have to manage all that firmware yourself. Okay, so I have my ESP32 app. I created it in platform IO uh, running inside of VS Code. And in the project, I'm going to walk you through very briefly just sort of what, what this process looks like in terms of what I have to actually include in order to do OTA DFU using this cooperative approach with the note card. And sort of the big piece of it is when the application runs, it scans to make sure I have two partitions. Because this is the ESP32, it uses the ESP IDF partition system. And this is in my, uh, sorry, this is my DFU.cpp and my main.cpp. Uh, I basically am running the part, the main part of the application, right? And so you'll see there's a couple of different things I need to do. I need to actually provide a product string. Uh, I have my button pin and LED pin on the ESP32 connected here. 
I'm setting that product UID, which is that unique identifier that tells the note card exactly where on the cloud service side to go. And that's here on the, on the right hand side. And then sort of the bones of my application is I'm basically, uh, I, I set my connection to NoteHub to our cloud service using the hub.set JSON request. I give it a serial number, uh, set it into periodic mode, basically configure its connection to, to the cloud service. And then so that's sort of the main part of the process. The other main part of the application is me actually checking for button presses. If, I, if the button is idle, I'm checking to see if there's a DFU that is available on the note card side. If I get a double, a double press, I perform a sync. I set the LED high and low, and then I can also do a sort of dummy measurement, voltage measurement that I send that as a, as a data point, as an event to NoteHub via a note.add request. That's all sort of the standard main part of the application. Everything else that's in here facilitates this part of actually doing the DFU detection, whether it's the uh, setting the product UID information here, uh, and more critically importantly, checking the DFU status when I start up. And then in my loop, basically polling for DFU. And all of that logic happens inside of this DFU.CPP helper. And this is what actually pulls in the ESP IDF uh, helpers for working with the partition system. I have a helper in here that shows me that the available partitions, I'm actually set in standard dual partition mode. Uh, I have a helper function that handles doing a CRC check on those chunks as I get the, the chunks from the note card. And then the polling process do, does sort of the, the main part. I'm actually getting every chunk of my firmware binary from the note card. The way that the process works is the note card gets the firmware from our NoteHub cloud service. And as soon as that's there, it sits in the note cards flash ready to be handed over to me on the host side. And what my ESP32 needs to do is basically get that one chunk at a time to CRC each chunk to make sure it's valid as it transferred across uh, serial or I squared C. And then I go through the process of reading those, validating it. And only after that can I get down to the point where I can actually uh, set that into my boot partition and then reboot and bring the device online. This is 311 lines of code that exist solely to handle that DFU process and then has to live on the main host itself. So in a cooperative DFU approach, once I've, count, once I've built all that, my firmware needs to know how to handle a binary when it comes across. Uh, I can build the binary. And once that binary has been built, I grab it from wherever location it lives. In this case, in platform IO, it goes in a build directory that I can get it from. And then what I'll do is I'll come over to the node hub side of my project and I'll load the firmware in here. You'll see I actually already have that in here. If I make a change and I set the, I go to my main.cpp and I set the major minor to 1.1 and that's the new version that I want to run, I'll upload that, uh, that firmware here. And you'll see I've got this 282K binary that's sort of sitting there ready to go. And the reason it's so large is because it has all of the ESP IDF DFU partition awareness stuff that's actually in baked into that binary as well. And once I have actually assigned that, or once I've actually figured out the right place for that to go, uh, I can then in NoteHub go into the host firmware tab, choose a binary to update, and I'll set that. I'll, I'll select this, this version right here, click proceed. And what happens on the NoteHub side is that that process kicks off. And the next time that I actually perform a synchronization. So I can actually connect to my note card here using uh, the dev tools at dev.blues.io. And the next time that I perform a sync, I can actually see that, I'll start to see that binary actually being downloaded uh, from, from the note hub service. And it goes and gets that. I'll see it actually here showing as idle right now because my device needs to reconnect. But you'll notice that I'm getting some notes here to actually go and, and sync that information. All of this trace information is what's happening behind the scenes as the note card goes and starts to fetch the binary uh, and pulls all that information down. And so in the background, I don't have to see this on the host side. In the background, this is all being downloaded. But once that download actually finishes, then my actual main application loads. I go into DFU poll, and then I go through the process of downloading and rebooting. So that's the cooperative DFU approach, right? The cloud service gives me the binary, but it's my responsibility on the host side to do the rest of the work.
So one of the important things to notice about that demo was that my actual application code made up a very small part of all the code that I had to add to my app in order for this process to work. Even with a library or a helper class that we provide to facilitate the transfer and update the process, my app still has to know a lot about how to update itself for this process to be useful. And in general, the strength of Cooperative DFU is that the developer has complete control over the host they use, and there are no guardrails beyond those imposed by the bootloader process dictated by the host, be it ST, Nordic, Scilabs, or the like. The drawback, as you saw in the demo, is that the developer, I, am responsible for handling the application of that new firmware update myself. I have to use that approach. It's all in my code. And not only is that manual and time consuming, it litters my project with code that's not core to the actual problem that I'm trying to solve, but if a change is introduced that I, that I create that bricks the device, the host ends up in a state where it can no longer be updated at all, meaning that the benefit of OTA DFU is completely lost. So with these two approaches, it appears like we developers basically have two choices. We can either give up control and get hands off OTA DFU, or we keep control and add time consuming and potentially device bricking work to our plates. But today I would like to introduce a third way, uh, one that provides nearly hands-off DFU without sacrificing choice, and it's something that we call outboard DFU. And when we use the word outboard, we use it here like an outboard motor on a boat, which is a motor that is attached to, but not an integrated part of the boat itself. It's effectively lashed onto a craft, and when placed in the water, it can control and propel it, but it can also be removed or replaced without damaging the boat itself. An outboard DFU is a capability that we've recently released in beta, and it provides the benefit of being able to use NoteHub for hosting and delivering binaries while allowing the note card to serve as the outboard motor for controlling the DFU process so that you don't have to litter your app code with a bunch of DFU aware code and functionality. And the best part about this is that we can do this while also giving you choice of MCU, family, programming language, and all of those things that we really prefer to have as developers. And this is possible because there's an increasing number of MCUs, modern MCUs, that have been produced in the last decade that ship with their primary bootloader in ROM, unmodifiable by any user operation. So on these devices, which includes all modern ST microelectronics and expressive microcontrollers, when a reset pin is asserted, the device enters its ROM bootloader, which can then load and execute code from a, from a variety of sources, including Flash, RAM, UART, USB, I2C, and SPI. And this ROM bootloader behavior is controlled by actively probing IO ports and by sampling the state of strapping pins that are specific or, or, speci or specially locked boot option, byte, uh, boot option bytes in Flash. And these manufacturer provided ROM bootloaders present really new options for us as engineers. Specifically, we can perform secure firmware updates in a manner that is far more flexible in terms of language and RTOS and far less vulnerable to bricking devices and introducing inadvertent programming bugs. So putting it another way, using this approach, you can defer the DFU process to the no card and allow it to be the thing that handles updating your host. And it can do it regardless of the state that the host is actually in. So remember how I said earlier that using a programmer like the ST-Link or J-Link doesn't require the manual button press bootloader dance? The reason for this is because those programmers connect via a special JTAG header, which has direct access to the strapping pins or option bytes of a host. And with Outboard DFU, we're taking the same approach by providing a capability for connecting the note card to the strapping pins on a set of hosts that we support and putting the device in a bootloader mode, laying down firmware, and then restarting the device. And at present, we support this with the SDM32, ESP32, and Nordic, and Nordic NRF52840. So you can use any of these in a custom design using a guide that we've created that lays out how to connect to a set of pins on the note card uh, to the MCU's reset boot and UART pins. And this also works with our note carrier F and an STM32 featherboard that we produce called the SWAN, Adafruit's Feather STM32 F405 Express or the Adafruit NRF52840 Express Feather, uh, or with the STM32 processor micro mod board from SparkFun. It works with all of these devices. So let's take a look at a demo of this now and see how much simpler our application code actually ends up being. So for the next couple of demos, I'm gonna keep the camera on my hardware the whole time so that you can actually see some changes that we're gonna be making as we, as we do firmware updates. But uh, I'm back to using, I'm on my desktop and I'm using the note card as before. This is a Wi-Fi version of the note card, our note carrier F. 
which does support this new outboard DFU feature because it's been wired to the boot reset and UART TX and RX pins on the feather connector. And for this host, um, I've added this STM32 board that we call the SWAN. And it, <clears throat> it uses an STM32 uh, L4R5 MCU. And like all modern ST uh, devices, it has a ROM bootloader. And like we discussed previously, the, the boot and reset buttons are the manual, the manual human driven way to get this in the bootloader. Uh, but we're gonna be able to do this automatically. So with everything powered up and connected, let's actually take a look at the firmware. And this is a simple Arduino app that uh, blinks the user LED every second. This is basically what happens. And I have a, uh, a pound define uh, 1000 milliseconds. So every second it's going to set the LED high, delay, set it low, delay, and loop again. That is the main functionality of my application. <clears throat> that simple. The only things that I need to do in order to enable this outboard DFU process that I talked about <clears throat> is just like I did with Cooperative DFU, I set the connection of the note card into the NoteHub cloud service so it knows where to go. I set its product UID, same as before. I'm going to give it a serial number to distinguish it, and I'm setting it in a continuous mode so it has a continuous connection. And then for Outboard DFU, all I need to do is I send a second request called card.dfu. I set the name of the processor, STM32, ESP32, NRF52840. You tell the note card which one of those it is so that it knows exactly what to do in order to stream firmware into the device. Turn it on, and I go. And I go. And so if I actually wanted to change this from 1,000 milliseconds to 250, so I wanted to update every quarter of a second, and then I built that version of the binary. It should take about a few seconds to actually build it. So I built that binary, and just like I did for cooperative DFU, I come into the firmware section of NoteHub.io. I add this binary, Swan Arduino ODFU. It's the second example here. It's 55K. So not that big compared to what I had for the ESP32 that included all that partition logic and my custom functionality. And then when I go in back into my device view, I see that I have my device online. I go into host firmware, and then I will select the Arduino ODFU bin right here. And so I am going to upload that. And then what I'll do in order to actually start the process is I will perform a sync from my device, just as you saw before. I'm in the web repl, I'm in the, the blues, the dev.blues.io web repl again. And as I perform that sync, I should be able to actually see that a, there we go, there's the binary that's actually coming across. I'll see these requests in trace mode that shows me that it's downloading the binary one little bit at a time. And it is actually, as it goes through the process of downloading that binary, it's gonna get it all together. So as soon as that process finishes, you'll notice that I lose my connection in the web REPL because the device has restarted. It's lost power, it's come online again. But you also notice that now my light is blinking a little bit faster. I can reconnect to the device uh, and it's fine. It's come back online, but I've all immediately seen that change as it actually has shown up on the device right there. So it's as simple as that. Literally, in order to opt into this outboard DFU process, this was all that I had to do. And because the note card knows how to perform that process for the ESP32, it's as good as done, right? Far easier than the ESP32 example from before. Uh, but, you know, it gets better because without more DFU, because the host really doesn't have to know anything about updating itself, you can effectively do a, dr a brain transplant between languages, between R tosses, really anything. So, for example, I have another project here, uh, and this project is a Zephyr R TOS project. So, uh, this is a, it connects to the same note card and it runs the same STM32 host, but you'll notice that the code is quite a bit different because this is an actual Zephyr application. It's not an Arduino application. Uh, so I'm using the exact same idea here. Uh, my, uh, in, in this case, what the process is doing is slightly different. I'm making a connection into the note card, but I'm doing the exact same hub.set. In this case, just changing the name of the, uh, of the, the serial number of the device so that I can distinguish it. And I have a couple, I have some logic here to, uh, to, to pick up a button press. And then anytime there's a button press, it does a note.add and it also turns off and on uh, the LED as well. So I'll be able to see slightly different functionality that comes across when the device actually comes online. So uh, much like before, what I'll do is I'll go through the process of building this and then I can pull it up into 
Note Hub when I'm ready to go. And you'll see when I come in here that the DFU status from before is completed. Uh, I have another version of the firmware for Zephyr, which you saw before, and this is about 46K. So relatively small, not much to it. And that includes that no card library. And I'll do a very, I'll do the same thing as before. I'll click update, but this time I'm going to select the Zephyr binary file. I click proceed. It'll queue that for DFU update. And if I come back to my device, what's going to happen now is I'll turn on trace mode and I will sync like before. And just like you saw before, what I'm going to do this point is just sort of wait for that binary to start to come down. The note card is going to pick it up. And just like before, it's going to download that. You'll see it's kind of already starting to come across. It's going to download it and then we'll see the functionality change on the device. And just as before, I lose my connection to the note card as it restarts, but I can reconnect at this point, turn trace mode back on. And now remember what I had decided to do for here is anytime that I, I press the, the user button on the device that I'll get a note that pops up and you'll see that note shows up here and then it ends up syncing to the note hub service. So when I refresh here, I can actually see my device ID is now Zephyr outboard DFU. If I click on my events, now I can actually see these button counts events that have gone across and without doing anything really physically on the device. All I did is I allowed the note card to go from an Arduino application into a Zephyr RTOS application in a matter of minutes using this outboard DFU capability. It's pretty stinking cool. So that ability to move between languages is powerful and it's actually something that we've seen as a real need in the IoT world where for the sake of speed and getting a POC out the door, we often want to be able to ship something written in Arduino or CircuitPython quickly, even if we intend to migrate to something like Zephyr or FreeRTOS in the future. And speaking of CircuitPython, there are actually a couple of additional features related to outboard DFU that are particularly interesting if you're working with this language on your devices. Because CircuitPython is awesome, it's fun to use, but a binary with a CircuitPython virtual file system in scripts is 500K. And I don't think that any of us wanna burn up the data plan on a cellular device pushing half-make binaries down to our devices. And so one of the cool things about CircuitPython that actually enables us to have a solution for this is that it actually exists in three pieces and each is pegged to a known memory address. There's the CircuitPython UF2 bootloader that's at address hex, uh, hex 800, the CircuitPython runtime that's at hex 801, or your app, the CircuitPython scripts and libraries that are at address hex 810. So what this means is that if you can build a binary that targets just those addresses, you can update just that piece of the app and save a lot of transport time and data, which is uh, pretty interesting. And this works through our outboard DFU approach with a couple of open source uh, utilities that we have created. One is the open source CircuitPython file system builder, which packages your, Py your Python files and libraries direct directory into a binary format, and which then allows the second utility to come into play. And that's called the note card bin pack utility which we, we can use to tell the note card when, that, when the process is loading, when outboard DFU is happening, it tells the note card which memory address to update when performing that outboard DFU. And BinPack actually works with any binary type, so you can use that to peg uh, parts of your application into any memory address and update those independently, but this is extra useful with CircuitPython. So let's take a look at a demo of this now. And I'm running the same device as before, but this time my Swan is running a circuit Python application that's blinking the LED. So let me show you. Okay, so I'm running the same device as before, but this time my Swan is running a circuit Python application that's blinking the LED every one second. And so here's the circuit Python application. It's very simple, it uses the same product UID. Uh, the one that's on there is running every one second. I'm going to change that here in a second. But again, just like before, I'm calling hub.set, sending the JSON request to the note card in order to assign it to my project, and then card.dfu to turn that on. And again, just like my initial Arduino application, very simple on and off of that LED every one second. Uh, in this case, I'm going to change this to 0.25. And then this is where I'm actually going to go through that process of then creating a binary from my files that I can then flash only by itself onto this drive. This device already has the CircuitPython runtime, the UF2 bootloader, the virtual file system is there, but it's that file system piece that I wanna change so I can keep this as small 
as humanly possible. All I really want to put on is the code.py file and then the library, which includes my note card SDK as well. So in order to actually uh, do this, I'm going to open up the CircuitPython file system builder. It's an open source uh, repository that you can clone to run locally. Uh, I'm going to set up a virtual environment for this. Set up the virtual environment for that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run Python main.py. I'm going to pull the files from my file system. So this is a pointer to a, fold, a directory that has the lib and code.py. And then I'm going to turn that into a binary called circuitpythonfiles.bin. And I'm as good as done. That goes in that bin directory there. And then the next piece is bin pack. As I mentioned before, bin pack is the piece that then tells the note card in the outboard GFU process what precise memory address in order to send this to. So uh, this is part of the note card utility, which is another open source utility that we have that's available in the Blues GitHub repository. So I'm going to call note card slash bin pack. I'm going to say this is bin pack for the STM32. The address that this binary is going to be pegged to is hex 8100. Like I mentioned before, everything at hex 800, everything at hex 801, the UF2 bootloader, the CircuitPython runtime, those will stay the same. The Outboard GFU process is only going to update this little piece right here. So that then creates that binary for me. So I can see the bin pack binary right here. Uh, I have one that I've created already, and this is when I go back to NodeHub and actually upload this firmware. So this is the last piece here, this bin pack file you'll see. Unlike the 500 meg uh, binary that I would get if I did everything in CircuitPython, this is only 78K that has just my files. So I can push that down just like before. And just as you've seen me do two other times already, I'm going to go into the device host firmware section. I'm gonna choose my bin pack device, click proceed, or my bin pack binary, pardon. And then I am off to the races. I'll go back here and I will initiate a sync just like before. And then when it sees that binary, it's gonna pull it down one little bit at a time, just like every other part of the process, and then apply that to the device. And now my device is back online, you'll notice. I'm still connected here to the note card, but look, now the LED is flashing every quarter of a second again, still running CircuitPython, and I did that process through Outboard DFU. So you've seen in just a few quick demos going from Arduino to Zephyr to CircuitPython, all using this exact same brain transplant Outboard DFU process. So that's Outboard DFU. And we think that this is an exciting new way to think about doing firmware updates and to rely on cloud infrastructure and intelligent controllers to facilitate the OTA DFU process without taking away your ability to choose the MCU family, language, or RTOS that you're most comfortable with. So to learn more about Outboard DFU and Blues, visit our developer portal at dev.blues.io. And if you're interested in grabbing any of our hardware, trying out a dev kit, you can grab that at shop.blues.io, SparkFun, or DigiKey. Uh, or you can scan this QR code and get 20% off of any of the kits that are available in our store. So thanks for joining the session today. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at brandon at blues.io or on Twitter at Brandon Satcherman. I'll also be here for Q&A. So thanks again.